。OK， 啊、哦，我们已经有小伙伴问，怎么还没有开始？我们呃九点正式开始，我们还有几分钟，大家稍微等一下。我们的呃所有的呃讲师还有主持人都已经到位。我们在正式开始之前，呃，还有两两三分钟，我给大家介绍一下，呃，这次的这个呃讲座的一些呃有关的呃知识，就是我们昨天呃请的是 Annual Reviews 的这个讲师呃总编来给咱们呃讲，然后有课后有小伙伴问怎么可以去多了解一些。呃，他们这个杂志社的信息，我现在给大家就介绍一下，就是我们这个 i journal 有一个公众号 ，i journal 公众号，我们最近就是每天都是在，呃，把我们呃邀请的这些机构，每天都有专门的文章去介绍，啊、呃，比如说今天我们是 CSP Canada Canada in 呃、uh, Science Publishing Group， 所以我们这个 CSP 这是有这个文章来。介绍，呃，然后呃，明天我们是邀请的 Plus， 所以说我们的文章也已经在昨天已经发出来了，所以大家可以关注我们的 i j o u r n a l 公众号，可以来了解更多的信息。呃，然后我给大家，今天我们正式开始之前，我花一分钟的时间，呃，我给大家来介绍一个。这个来介绍一个功能，就是呃，我们呃这个直播的话，我们每次大家在进入直播之前，进入到我们的小鹅通的主页，右上角有一个分享的功能。我们鼓励大家，就是把我们把这么好的讲座给呃呃分享出去，就是我们鼓励大家，你帮我们宣传一下，然后大家可以看，我给大家演示一下，你点击这个分享的按钮。就可以生成一个专属你自己的这么一个二维码和小海报，请大家就是把我们分享出去，然后如果有人是通过你这个海报来进入我们直播间的，我们的系统会自动记录出来，而且我们会有一个邀请达人榜，大家可以看这边，就是我们，比如说我们昨天的讲座，我们有一位叫云上小斌的朋友。呃，他邀请了五十五位好友来参加我们的这个讲座。我们最后就像我们宣传说的似的，我们最后会评出三名我们的推广大使，我们会给一定额度的红包的现金。当然，我们这次也是呃特别的力度很大，我们也最后会给一次，呃，评一个最厉害的我们的推广员，我们给一次免费标准润色的机会。所以说，我们也是希望大家就是帮我们把我们未来几天以及我们，呃，哦，就是说今天的大家分享已经来不及了，就未来几天的，呃，这个直播帮我们分享，帮我们呃来宣传一下，邀请更多的老师同学来到我们的直播间。好，今天已经九点零一分，现在我把时间交给我们的主持人，呃，由他来介绍，呃，和开始我们今天的报告。Okay. Uh, okay. I will. Uh, 我我会用两种语言，嗯、呃，介绍咱们今天的嘉宾，还有出版社。然后，呃，因为我们是有呃，分别向国内和国外同时直播的。Okay. 呃，那我就开始。呃，欢迎今天来，呃，欢迎大家来听我们的讲座。我是今天的呃主持人张宁。然后我是投币德学术的呃创办人，嗯、呃，我们这次系列讲座一共有五次，嗯、呃，是 Peer Review Week， 也就是同行评议周的一部分。同行评议周是呃每年一次的全球活动，呃，旨在宣传同行评议在保持科学质量方面发挥的重要作用。今年的主题是信任同行评议。今天的报告同时面向中国和国外用户直播。首先，我们会呃邀请呃 Canadian Science Publication 的执行总监 Susan k e t t l e r 为我们做报告。啊、呃，然后投币德培训部的负责人嗯、呃、Gary s t y k e 博士与 Susan 进行互动交流。最后，呃，我们回答大家的问题
Okay, I will repeat in English. Welcome to the second webinar in our series of peer review week webinars organized by Top Edit Author Services. Uh, my name is Ning Zhang, the founder and the CEO of Top Edit. Our web webinar series um, comprise five events, all part of our contribution of a, a global peer review week events. The stem of this week, this uh, week is the trust in uh, peer review. Uh, thanks for jo joining us. Our guest speaker, Susan Kettler, the executive, ex executive director uh, of a Canadian science publishing will give uh, her presentation in a moment. And then we will have time for a discussion uh, Q and A at the end. Feel free to ask any questions throughout this webinar uh, by typing on them into the uh, chat box. Uh,下面我介绍一下呃加拿大呃科学出版嗯社呃也就是CSP. Uh,等会儿苏苏珊嗯应该会做一些更具体的介绍。呃,CSP是加拿大领先的。非营利科学出版社他们有二十四种科学期刊包括呃Facets这是一本呃这是加拿大第一本多学科开放获取的科学期刊呃苏珍本人拥有超过三十年的科学出版专业经验曾在公司担任过多个职位呃并在CSP从
And scientific journals are what CSP is all about. As Ning was saying, CSP is Canada's largest not-for-profit publisher of international scientific journals. We make scientific knowledge easy to discover, use, and share. As a not-for-profit company, we have two main strategic goals, to protect and instill trust in scholarly research and to support research through high-quality, technologically advanced publications. We have a vision, a world where everyone is empowered with scientific knowledge. And our mission is to be champions of scientific knowledge exchange, committed to strengthening the integrity, relevance, and reach of science. We ensure that scientific knowledge is easy to discover, use, and share. We own and publish 24 international science journals, including three fully open access journals. Our journals are read in over 125 countries worldwide. Our editorial boards consist of internationally renowned subject expert editors and peer reviewers. We have editorial board members in 40 countries. Our peer reviewers are worldwide and 89% of our authors appreciate the peer review experience with us based on surveys that we've run. We pride ourselves on having personalized editorial service. We employ 10 editorial assistants to manage peer review of your manuscript. They ensure each submission is treated with respect and they're there to answer any questions you might have during the publishing process. If your manuscript is accepted, one of our 19 scientific publishing experts are there to take over the copy editing and to manage the production of your manuscript. Now, I am hoping that Josephine Shortino is online. She is one of my employees and I was hoping that she could speak briefly about the copy editing experience and what you could expect. Josie, are you there? Sure, I'm here. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? It's all good? All right. Thanks, yes. Suzanne. And, uh, and thanks, Ning and, uh, and Gareth for making this happen today. So yeah, as, as Suzanne said, we, we truly do pride ourselves on, on, on giving authors personalized service. So that means that you could pick up the phone and speak to someone. And that means there's a face behind looking at your paper. There's a person looking at every word and every line. And our scientific publishing editors are educated in the discipline that they're editing. So if they're editing a microbiology journal, they know microbiology, engineering, same thing. And so what we are, what our scientific editors, publishing editors do is that they are, they're aware of the nomenclature in the discipline. They're aware of the technical and publishing standards in that discipline, and they apply that to every paper. Essentially, our scientific publishing editors are there to make you as an author look good. So they, they check, they check the ref, they, they check the permissions, they make sure, we make sure the references are proper and properly referenced and cited, and we take care of that for you, at, and that's part of our service at CSP. And, and we have 19 of those in-house uh, working, working for us, essentially working for you as an author. Thank yeah. you, Justine. Sure, sure, thanks, Suzanne. Our journal titles cover fields across the spectrum of science, technology, engineering, and math in both fundamental and applied sciences. And I'm hoping that you can read this screen but we go from everything from biological sciences all the way to information and computing and everything in between, like agriculture, chemistry, medical and health, engineering, earth sciences, physical sciences, environmental sciences, math, and environmental design. And these are our beautiful journal covers so that you can see our suite of journal titles. I'll be talking to you about two of these in a moment. Papers in our journals come from around the world. These are the top 10 countries represented in our journals. Most of the articles come from Canada. The second biggest uh, suppliers of manuscripts is the US, but third, a very close third, is China. And this is a map that shows where our editorial board members reside. So as you can see, it is a global enterprise. This is a summary of some of the key metrics from our organization for 2019. We had 5,000 citations for, uh, and almost 2,500 articles that we published. 
Our editorial board's teams represent 700 individuals. 102 countries were represent, represented in our journals in 2019, and we have seven, more than 7,100 Twitter, Twitter followers. And the little donut, the colorful donut in the middle, I'm sure most of you recognize that as an altmetric badge. And it shows that we had more than 11,000 mentions and that that was recorded in their database. Each one of our papers has an altmetric badge associated with it. The, I mentioned earlier that the highest percentage of published papers comes from China. So it's no surprise that Chinese funders also figure prominently. As you can see here, two Chinese funders are in the top five funders providing research grants to our published content. The foundation of everything that we do at CSP is based on peer review. Our journal editors in chief and their editorial boards take great care in finding experts in the field of your research to review your work for scientific rigor and to provide constructive feedback to you to improve your manuscript. We survey our authors on a regular basis to ensure we're meeting your expectations. 89% have rated the review they received as good or excellent. We also have tools in place for our editorial boards so they can ensure that the papers that are published are unique. And they check for plagiarism using a tool called Authenticate. They want to identify problems before a paper is accepted for publication. There are two policies that I wanted to talk to you about today. The first is our publishing policy. We posted a copy of the policy to our website so that we're transparent with our ethical issues. We align our policy with international standards like the Committee on Publication Ethics. Our policy states what practices are unacceptable in our journals, such as duplicate submissions, duplicate publications, and plagiarism. We also take the time to explain what authorship means and therefore who should be included as an author on a paper. The second policy that I wanted to introduce you to is our new data principles and availability policy. Note that I've said it's coming soon and that's because we are launching this policy with our new website redesign which is scheduled to be launched in October. Publishers have been preserving published content in journals and depositing them in archives for years. What about the data sets these manuscripts are based on if they're not published? In the past, unpublished data sets were left to authors to manage without any guidance. Often data were kept on a local hard drive and lost when the computer died or was damaged. And sometimes after a researcher died, nobody knew where their data was stored or how to retrieve it. Universities and funders are now seeing the value in these data sets and asking authors to follow data management plans to ensure their data is kept safe. These data sets can be used to validate the science, to check for reproducibility, or to give other researchers with similar data sets something to compare their data with. As a publisher, we want to help with the efforts to make research data available and safe. Our new policy says that peer reviewers should be given access to data sets if they need to evaluate the manuscript they are reviewing. Every author should provide a statement saying whether their data are available for re readers and how readers can get a copy of their data. That statement will be published with the manuscript. And for those authors who have data who are freely available on the web or in a server, CSP will include a link in their paper to that data set so readers can easily see the data. Now I move on to open access. Full open access is the practice of providing free and unrestricted online access to the products of research. It means that peer review content is immediately free to readers and that it is free forever and includes guidelines or licenses that communicate how readers can share and reuse content. We have three fully open access journals as shown on this plot slide, Facets, Arctic Science, and Anthropocene Coasts. In a minute, I'll be talking to you about Facets and Anthropocene Coasts because I think that they will be of great interest to you. Authors publishing in CSP subscrip subscription journals have many options available so that they comply with their funders open access requirements, inclu including major funders in, in China. Authors can place their accepted manuscript into their institution's repository 
or other website immediately upon acceptance. CSP can deposit an author's ma acceptive manuscript into T-Space. T-Space is a repository that's run by the University of Toronto. We have a partnership with them. And we ask our authors if they would like us to deposit the accepted manuscript for them, because not all authors have an institutional repository where they can store the paper. So this makes their work freely available within five days of publication. And remember, this is for our subscription journals. So this is much more than most funders ask for. Authors and CSP journals can also purchase open access for their article so that their final, final published paper, the version of record, is freely available among, immediately upon publication and has a license that allows others to reuse the material, but of course, citing the original work. As promised, now I'll talk to you about two of our open access journals that I think will be of interest to you. The first is Anthropocene Coasts. Anthropocene Coast is the first journal we've published in partnership with another organization. It's jointly published by CSP and East China Normal University. And it's also affiliated with the association Future Earth Coasts. Anthropocene Coast is a multidisciplinary journal. It publishes research that aims to understand and predict the effects of human activities like climate change on estuarian and coastal regions. Because East China Normal University pays the production costs of the journal, there are no article processing charges for manuscripts submitted before December 31st, 2021. So that's over a year from now. Papers are disseminated and discoverable in major databases. And as with all of our journals, all papers undergo rigorous peer review to ensure high editorial standards. All content is professionally edited and presented. All papers are online within five days of acceptance and are immediately citable. So if your research is in the area of coastal studies, I highly recommend that you go and visit Anthropocene Coast to see if it's of interest to you. The second fully open access journal I wanted to draw your attention to today is FACETS. I'll spend a bit more time on FACETS because it has a very broad scope and probably would be of use to any of you on the call today. The journal has a vision to advance science by publishing high quality research that represents the multifaceted global community of research and offers choice to our authors. Its scope includes biological and life sciences, biomedical and health sciences, earth and environmental sciences, engineering, technology and math, integrative sciences, physical sciences and data science. FACETS is Canada's first and only multidisciplinary open access science journal. It was launched in 2016. All papers that are published in FACETS undergo rigorous peer review. Its editorial board consists of 80 members from 11 countries around the world. Published articles so far are across 35 different fields and we expect that will grow. And FACETS is the official journal of the Royal Society of Canada's Academy of Science. We're quite proud of that. In 2018, one of the FACETS articles made Altmetrics top 100 list. The article, Scientists on Twitter, Preaching to the Choir or Singing from the Rooftops, was ranked 38 out of 2.8 million papers in the Altmetric database. And that was based on its Altmetric score of over 3,500. And you can see there are some other pretty impressive data in there. For example, it made the news, people were writing blogs about it, and it even influenced a policy document. Many, many people were talking about this paper on Twitter, and they still do. So if you decide to submit a paper to FACETS, here's some things you might want to know. It has a dynamic scope, we've already spoke about that, with a multitude of disciplines. But it also has diverse range of paper types. For example, research articles, review articles, communications, notes, perspectives, editorials, comments and replies, science applications, and form articles. Like all CSP journals, acceptance is based on both the soundness of science and evidence of advancing knowledge. So even though it's a multidisciplinary journal, it's important to our editorial team that we be advancing knowledge with this journal. 
facets accepts re replication studies and studies that show negative results, which very few journals do. FACETS authors are also invited to submit a plain language summary of their manuscript, and that we will use to boost your research by communicating to a wider audience, allowing your research to be understood by non-experts, policymakers, and the general public. We post plain language summaries to a platform called Medium, and then we link to that via our social media feeds. I mentioned the different sections in facets and one that I find rather interesting because it is so broad is the integrative sciences section. It filled a niche that in Canada, at least, we didn't have in any other journal. So this section allows authors to publish research that identifies, discusses, and investigates cross-disciplinary links that can lead to innovative advances in science communication, science and policy, science education, science and society, conservation and sustainability, ethics, and public health. A forum for researchers and policymakers to publish, share, and discuss the regulatory frameworks that shape both and are shaped by our science. Now, FASIS is not sponsored by another organization, and it is open access. So because of that, we do charge to publish in the journal. But as you can see, the article processing charges, or what some people call an APC, is very low. It costs $13.50 US for most paper types. Comments and editorials are $500 US. And here's some information about how you can go and visit the journal and talk, talk to us on Twitter about it and what you think of the content. In summary, why should you publish with CSP? Well, I hope I've, I've imparted how much we value your paper. Through rigorous peer review, we, and we employ editorial assistance to help you through the peer review process. As Josephine was saying, we copy edit and prepare your paper with much care and diligence, and we have subject-specific scientific publishing editors on staff to do that. You keep the copyright of your published work, and we do not charge fees for you to reuse your material. We comply with major funders, including Chinese funders and those who are part of Plan S Coalition. You get to choose the most relevant journal among our 24 journals for your research, and you get to meet your funders' requirements for open access as well. We keep your work safe and archived in established archives, portico and clocks. However, we also boost your paper. I mentioned that we have an altmetric badge for each one of the articles that we publish. This connects articles to researchers, experts, and the public. After an article is published, we tally metrics. We list who is citing your paper, and we soon will be listing the number of viewers for each of, each of the published manuscripts as well. We use robust metadata, and we send it to all the major ind indexers, which means your work will be discovered, and your work will be available worldwide. We've also loaded all of our journals into a new app called Research App, which is a new style feed for academics to find newly published papers across publishers. The app pulls newly published papers from publicly available RSS feeds. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very interesting. And we learned a lot about uh, CSP. And, um, I know that, that our authors and, and colleagues in China will be very interested in learning about your journal offering, um, in particular the open access side of things, because this is one of the big questions that we get asked um, about journal selection and about open access. Um, what I'm going to do um, is just talk for uh, 10, 15 minutes about peer review, um, if that's all right with everybody, and then we'll come back and we'll We'll, we'll get into some of the questions that, that, that our, audience is, our audience is asking. So I'm just going to quickly uh, share my screen, if I can figure out how to do that. Yeah. One second. We love Zoom. Just a second. All right, so now you should be able to see my screen and I hope that everybody can see and hear me. Yeah, okay. we can see that. Awesome. 
Well, there you go. That's the poster for today's event. And our authors ask us often about peer review. And of course, this is peer review week. So let's talk for 10 minutes or so about how to survive peer review as an author. Very important. What is peer review? How you can select and understand the peer review process as a young researcher and what the different decisions that journals that publishing companies like CSP send back to us and what do they mean? How can we understand what journals are doing? And one of the questions that, that people have asked um, in, in Suzanne's presentation, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, is how do journals select reviewers? On what basis do journal, do journal editors select those reviewers? Can authors suggest? Can you be proactive with journals? Can you come in with suggestions for peer reviewers yourself? And we know, of course, that we should not be sending academic articles to journals that are not using peer review. Peer review is, of course, the cornerstone of academic publishing and all reputable international journals around the world are using it as the basis for judging the quality of scholarly content. So we know that peer reviewed articles are reliable because authors have used this process prior to publication, very important. But, but different journals use different styles. And this is another question that we want to come back and we want to ask you about um, from your portfolio of CSP journals a little bit later as well. And that's what kind of review are the journals using? Because different journals have different styles and it's important for our authors to understand our colleagues around the world to understand what kinds of peer review journals are using because the way that we react as authors to these different systems can vary. Are your journals completely open? Do the authors and the reviewers know each other's identity? Are the journals single blind? So only one of the two parties is aware of the other's identity, often just the reviewer, so the author may not know the identity of the peer reviewer, but the peer reviewer will know who the authors are, or as authors tend to want, actually, double blind peer review is thought to be one of the fairest ways to assess academic papers submitted to journals, in particular in cases where authors come from non-English speaking countries, because people do feel often that their level of English gets assessed by the journal at the outset. And if the journal or the journal editor sees that they're coming from a non-native English speaking country, they may very well um, look less favorably on that submission. So I don't know if that's also something that that we'll come back to and have a discussion about in a little bit. We teach authors as well, of course, that they get a view back from the editor that may not necessarily reflect all of the comments that come to the journal from the reviewer. Reviewers often make comments to editors that authors never get to know about. And so how we respond to the comments that come back from peer reviewers is also critically important. And this touches on the issue of trust in peer review. Do we have a feeling that really the decisions that journals are making about our papers are based on all of the comments that the journals actually received? And we know that peer reviewers often, and this is an issue that we're anxious to also discuss with publishers and colleagues around the world because often the peer review process from an author's perspective can be quite a negative experience. Peer reviewers often look for problems with submitted manuscripts. They tend to think, where are the issues with this particular paper? And as we know as authors, often these issues show up in the methods section. So I'm keen to emphasize that young researchers in particular, authors around the world should reach out to their mentorship networks during the writing and research process to build a pool of potential colleagues who might be usable by them, by journals, as peer reviewers for their articles. So who can you involve? Send your work 
to other colleagues, send your work out to your international network so that when you submit to a CSP journal, when you submit to Facets or Anthropocene Coasts and the editor comes back to you and asks potentially for suggestions for peer review, or indeed you put into your covering letter suggestions for peer review, you can get ahead of the process, the peer review process, by having people in your cover letter that you are already talking to about your research, that you already know have a potentially favorable view of your research. That's why it's so important for us to network as academics. And I know that that's also something that we'll want to come back and talk about in a little bit. We encourage young researchers all over the world to network, to be in touch with other colleagues in other countries, other researchers working in other research groups to talk about their work, to attend conferences, to network online, of course, which is the way that we're mostly doing things these days, but build that mentorship network so that you have the opportunity to make informed suggestions for peer review when it comes to that point. And of course, journals give you this option often and very often these days, again, I don't know the situation with the CSP journal family, but often the option exists for reviewers to be deselected or selected in these journal online systems. So that's something for authors, for young researchers to keep in mind also. What do the comments mean? What are the different decisions that come back from journals? We're getting usually minor or major comments that come back from our journals and how we respond as authors to those different comments is actually quite different because we know that major revisions from a journal, usually then the editor's going to be looking to solicit additional comments, probably from the same or same group of peer reviewers, whereas minor comments that come back from a journal, usually that's just left to the authors to make those changes and then the paper hopefully is going to get accepted. How can you do this effectively as a young researcher? Always the most important thing to do is to show your editor that you are taking this process seriously. So making that response document with your comments interspersed with the comments that come back from journals. And I know we know that journal editors are looking to make sure that you are doing everything that you're asked to do within reason, of course, but to show the journal editor that you take this process seriously and be polite. There's no reason why you can't make your peer reviewers, your editors feel good about their contribution to the process. Thank you for the wonderful comments. Thank you for the amazing, insightful remarks on my work. I know that when I get these kinds of comments back as an editor, as a reviewer, I feel good. I think, oh, I made a good comment. I helped this author. And that puts me in a better frame of mind to make positive comments on that article when I'm asked to by the journal to send it back with a decision. So have you received review comments from a journal? Most important thing to do is to take the process seriously. Show the editor that you are fully incorporating all of those suggestions into a revised manuscript, addressing your rebuttal letter politely back to the editor. We will give you templates for doing this of course, helping you to effectively manage the process. We, of course, can also edit your English to help you be as good as you can be with those comments that go back to the journal. So peer review at international journals, trust in peer review at international journals is very important, but I would emphasize that how you select and manage the process and how you deal with the different decisions that come back from journals is very important. And with that, I think it's time for me to go silent or at least minimize the screen and we can throw this open for discussion um, with our other panelists. I don't know like if 
um, Suzanne or any of your team, you have some comments that you'd like to make about the peer review process, I think, in particular, because that's, that's what we're, that's what we're celebrating, peer review absolutely, week. Absolutely, absolutely, and I completely agree. Cornerstone of everything that we do in the journals. Our journals would not exist if it were not for peer review, because what would be the point? And as I mentioned earlier, the authors really appreciate the comments that they get back from peer reviewers because they, may not, they might not have their paper accepted first time around, but they then have the material and the answers they need on how to improve it so that they can go forth and get their paper published. And so I'm a firm believer that that is the real value of peer review. It's making that manuscript better along, along the way. You were asking a few things about our peer review process. Yes, absolutely. For, like, let's, let's talk about that because that's that sure. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned is whether it is a single blind or double blind or open. And uh, the, the, uh, the entire industry really does range. Um, but what we, where we land is in the single blind right now. We, when we launched Facets, we had a conversation about whether we should have open peer review because some journals are doing that now where the author knows who the peer reviewers are and the peer reviewers know who the authors are. And in some cases, journals will even publish the reviews along with their paper. Uh, we've, we chose to go along with what we know best, which is single blind. So in that case, the authors do not know who the peer reviewers are unless the peer reviewers decide that that's fine and they can, they can identify themselves to the authors. So for the most part, it is, it is a single blind where the authors do not have that. We've, we've spoken about double blind and you never know, we might experiment with it someday. I, I understand the concern that people think that they could be, um, there could be some prejudice against a particular person because the reviewer knows them and, and perhaps doesn't appreciate their work. Uh, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, and do you give authors the opportunity to make suggestions for reviewers? I mean, I know some, some publishing companies have banned that practice completely. Um, no, we've, we've not banned it. We, and we do allow authors to, to present names of people that they think could, could review the paper for them. It doesn't mean that we'll choose them, but it does give a starting point and a choice for the, for the, for the editorial team to make that final decision. They can also indicate whether they feel that there is an individual who would have a conflict of interest and shouldn't be allowed to peer review their paper. I see. Now that's an area of confusion, especially for our colleagues um, in China. Like, so what, what does that, what could that mean? Like when, I mean, cause, cause people have um, issues often with submission systems and they don't understand often the questions that they're being asked in the submission system. So, so what is, what is that? What is a conflict of interest and why would I deselect somebody as part of the submission system? So if you felt that there was somebody who was competing with your research, for example, and that they would get a competitive advantage by reading your paper before it's published. You may not want them to, um, right. to review your paper. And I, I'm not sure, honestly, whether our review system allows you to select and deselect, but we, you can always put it in your cover letter. Okay. Yeah, we, we try to emphasize to researchers just how important the covering letter is. Mm -hmm. because often people don't bother with it all that much or they write something very short like in a few minutes and they don't like you know put the effort into it but your editors are actually looking at the covering letter yes right? and, and as i mentioned we also have editorial assistants to assure that these all these pieces of information are read okay okay cool wonderful so i mean peer review is important you mentioned that 89 percent of your um, authors rate that experience as excellent which is Fantastic. And the turnaround time too is very um, fast. I was surprised to hear like just how, how quick, especially in the open access journals, like authors can expect to see their papers appearing online once, once accepted. Which is well, that's right. and, and that's actually true for all of our journals, not just the open access ones. So within five days, and it's five days because we have to, we have to prepare the paper to get it onto the into the T-Space repository. And so there's a bit of a technical issue there. So that takes maximum of five days, but usually faster. And it's available for people to read. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. T-Space is a preprint server, right? It's a preprint server. No, it is not. T-Space is not a preprint server. 
It is, it is a, an institutional repository with the University of Toronto Libraries. Okay, I can hear um, uh, Dr. Zhang. Do you want to come in and do some translations? Uh, yeah. Uh, so what, what do you mean five days? Five days is um, what, what time? What turn? You, you, the author can get feedback? So what this means is that if an author's paper is accepted for publication, oh, okay. within, after, after that point, it takes us five business days to ensure that the accepted manuscript is available in an institutional repository that is open. Okay, thank you. So I got some questions. Uh, one question is, uh, so uh, how long is the, uh, the, 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 the period of the uh, review, uh, especially for the open access journal facet, will will the the, the time uh, shorter? I mean, uh, so is it the the also they they want to know uh, if the 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 peer review uh, is uh, faster than normal journal? Um, it is actually not faster than a normal journal because as I mentioned earlier, we, we have the same peer review process that we do for all of our journals. To us, it's more important to get it right than it is to be quick. And uh, Celia, do you have the data on that? Celia Charal is the managing editor for facets and I've asked her to join to help out with any facets related questions. Yeah, uh, so I'd say the time to first decision for facets um, last year was within the sort of 30 day period. So that would be the time from submission to receiving a decision with peer review reports. Um, usually a reviewer is given a deadline of when they're invited, they're given a deadline of returning their review within 10 days. Um, we recognize that reviewers themselves can be really pressed for time, so we don't want to overburden our pool of reviewers, and we want to make sure that they provide the right, you know, the, enough information for an editor to make uh, an informed decision. Um, I don't have in front of me how that compares with other open access journals, but around 30 days is about the industry standard that we aim for. Um, of course, on a case by case basis, things could, you know, take a little bit longer or go a little bit quicker. It really does depend on the paper, but on average, we're looking for that 30 day time. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, so Ning, uh, can you repeat the question and the answers shortly in Chinese to our audience? 他们说那个Facets这个期刊的大概的审稿周期是30个工作日 OK, I also have some questions from uh, Chinese audience So if uh, the author think he or she was treated unfair by peer reviewer So uh, how you deal with uh, that uh, uh, situation? Thank you, that's a very good question. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we have a publication policy that is on our website. And in the publishing policy, it states that if an author feels that they were unfairly treated, that they should take up the matter with the editor-in-chief of the journal. And the editor-in-chief will talk to them about what they, how they felt that they were treated unfairly and they will do a review of the situation. Oh, okay. How, no, uh, okay, I will uh, translate it. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Susan的意思是,就是你可以跟那个主编写信,然后告诉这个主编你是被不公平对待了,然后有可能会有这个发生的机会。确实有可能是存在这种情况，你最好是跟主编写信。Okay, uh, so how you uh, another question is how you select a peer reviewer? Uh, what is the standard? I'm a PhD student. Can I become a peer reviewer? The way that we choose the peer reviewers is through our submission uh, software, Scholar One. 
they provide a database of experts in all the different fields of research. When uh, an article comes in, we check the, the subject and we go to the database to find peer reviewers that way. I did mention also that we look at whether uh, uh, an author has suggested people for peer review as well, and they would be considered as well. Uh, whether somebody can become a peer reviewer, they typically they would have to be in our system and the way that they get into the Scholar One system is by submitting manuscripts to us and then their research becomes known and part of the database. Okay, that's, uh, thank you. Uh, 我简单, uh, 翻译一下, 就是他们是用那个 Scholar One的系统, 应该是Elsewhere的一个投稿系统, 如果你, 呃, 如果他们就是通过这个 Scholar One来选择 他们的Peer Review, 如果你有那个可以推荐的人他们也是可以考虑的如果你推荐的这个人不在这个Scholar Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to jump in with some questions from our Indian colleagues. We have quite a number of um, people listening to this webinar from, from other parts of the world. Um, and so um, one of our colleagues in India is asking, open access is not accessible for some students, even in developed countries from reputable institutions. How can students um, from, from some countries where maybe there's less research funding available, um, get access to open access journals when the, when the APC is, is quite high? I mean, this is, this is another common question that we, that we get asked. I mean, that is, I yes. know you mentioned that your APC is actually not that high, and I agree with that compared to all like open access journals, but I mean, we have the same issue here in Hungary, in Central Europe, like people have no, access to research funding at that level. So what would your response to that be? We, we do offer um, Celia or Josephine, I'll ask you to, to uh, take your mics off so that you can guide me on this one. But I do believe that the policy is, is that for, uh, there are certain countries where we do waive the fees. Is that correct? That's right. It's um, if you look up research for life, so the number four and then research and research for life, um, those are countries that tend to get open access fees waived, uh, I believe, for every open access journal, but definitely for FACETS and, and our other two journals as well. So that, that's, that's a start. And then we, we actually agree and we're quite vocal about the fact that we don't think that the burden of research uh, that the cost should fall on the shoulders of researchers. Unfortunately, the APC is the predominant model right now. We want to work with librarians in the future to help to find a model that librarians can, can fund. And so that way we'll be able to have both open access and not be charging authors, but we're not there yet. Understood. Do you, have a, do you have a decent coverage of submissions from, from all over the world? I think you touched on that. We do. Moment. Yes, we do. Awesome. And the, sec the second question from our Indian colleague is, uh, what do you think the essential qualifications or skills to be developed by students would be to get involved in peer review? Is, it, is, that, is that a question that we could, we, could, we could answer? The kinds of skills that students need to develop to become peer reviewers? To become peer reviewers that's interesting i know in canada there is something called stem fellowship and i don't know if there is anything like that in india stem fellowship they they have um uh they prepare they're preparing students to be leaders in the future and in one aspect of what they do is journal publishing and they've actually started their own journal we we uh we host that for them for free and they run the journal themselves and so therefore, if there are similar types of journals at your university, I would recommend that you, you volunteer uh, to, to learn about how to run a journal. And Josephine, did you have something to add? Sure, sure, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, 
Well, one of the, if you're, if you're a prospective author, if you're just a, an early career researcher and you do want to get in and, and be a peer reviewer, I think it, it starts by speaking to your supervisor, speaking to your principal investigator. And I know we have, we don't, some of our journals are starting to, to promote a program like a peer review mentorship program where younger early career peer reviewers are working with more senior reviewers and they kind of test out their peer review muscles, so to speak, on, on particular manuscripts. And they have a, um, uh, that senior re reviewer is reviewing their, re their peer review and then submitting on behalf of both to the journal. So some of our journals are starting that program. And I think it's, it's one thing, I think a, an early career researcher would be, uh, it'd be very important to speak to your principal investigator about that. And of course, the, the kind of the obvious, you know, read a lot in your field, um, be active, even on social media, those are really good ways to get your name out there and get other journals aware of you and aware of the research you're doing. And, uh, and, and definitely, definitely, but the, the most important thing here would be to reach out, reach out to your principal investigator. I agree. Good advice. That's Great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we actually get like some situations quite often where um, that doesn't happen where, and it should happen. But, but I, I remember a case quite recently where a, a student um, from one of our Chinese groups asked me a question about, you know, my professor's asking me to spend time working on a peer review, to review a, a document, to review a paper. Um, and should I do it? You know, like, and what credit will I get? For doing this because unfortunately what often happens as you know is that you know the the group leader the research team leader will will, will pass these tasks off to other members mm -hmm. of the group and then sadly often submit them into journals as and, and i so i think it we would argue that it's important that we do develop mechanisms so that young researchers can get access to the process but also credit for the for the work they do you know Absolutely. I would completely agree with that. Cool. I don't know if, if um, uh, Dr. Zhang or, or anyone from our Chinese side wants to jump back in with some translations for this yeah, information. Yeah. I have some questions. Okay. Uh, this, this question is for Susan. Can I contact the journal editor before submitting to my paper? Will he give me some uh, suggestion before submission? And so they're looking for guidance on their paper before it has been submitted. Is that correct? Yes. 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 So uh, something like uh, before submission, they want some uh, yeah. comments or suggestion. I mean, we, we do have our instructions to authors. That's more of a stylistic uh, recommendations that are provided to authors ahead of submission and strongly advise anybody who is submitting to a journal to read the instructions to authors thoroughly so that they can decide whether, well, first of all, whether the scope is correct. If, is it the right journal for your work? But second of all, what are the expectations of that journal? Josie, yeah. Josephine? Maybe, sure. uh, maybe I think the question is about if my paper is qualified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Their journal, something like that. I think sure. most also uh, care about that. Sure. Well, uh, some uh, I think some of our editors are open to receiving. I think most of them are open to receiving pre-submission inquiries. So you have a, if you have a question about oh, is my paper appropriate? Right? Is it does it fit within the scope of the journal? Um, mm -hmm. I think those emails.